I'm super excited that you and I are sharing our vision. Finally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here's Mariam. Hi, Mariam. Yeah. Um, so yes, for anyone who's with us other than Mariam. Hi, Mariam. So glad you're Hello. here. Uh, I'm Bonita. I'm here with Jean-Marie and we are um, both psychic intuitives with um, the ability to see the past through time and the future. Um, so we are going to share some visions. Ah, people are popping in. Hi, Kat. Hi, Debbie. We are going to share uh, some of the visions that's happening on Earth now on Into the Future. If you have questions or requests, feel welcome to share them. And I will, oh, hi, Angela. Great, people are coming on. So um, first, we should talk a little bit about what's happening in the here and now in the US and Earth, um, maybe a little bit of why. Um, I do want to say uh, last, what was it, February, when I did the first, maybe early March, the first time I did this with uh, Uma Alexandra Bibat, everything we predicted came true. Uh, but it was interesting, our predictions of, of what we saw was so different. I was telling Jean-Marie earlier, um, Uma said at the end of May, she sees borders opening up, everyone's traveling again, you know, restaurants, businesses opening up again. And I said, by the end of May, I see people rioting, protesting, rioting in the streets. I see revolutions happening and I see all of this becoming so much worse. And, um, and I said, and I see political institutions crumbling. So we had opposite visions and we're like, so we'll see what happens. And both of us were accurate. Both of us were completely accurate. It was at the end of May, people were going on holidays again, borders were opening up and we had riots and political institutions are certainly crumbling. So it doesn't matter if Jean-Marie and I are in agreement on anything. We just are both sharing what we see and then We'll see what happens. Odds are what we see is what will happen. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, Jean-Marie, do you, would you like to start? Do you have any thoughts that have been ever present on your mind or? Well, there are a lot of thoughts that are ever present and a lot of different visions, depending upon the perspective that I take a look at when I look out into the future. And I think a lot of things are, you know, the things that people see and, you know, the fear that's out there, which, you know, is ever present on the TV and ever present, um, especially in this time when we all have to be so cautious because it is all around us. And it's a virus like we have never seen before. And people who have had it, who feel as though they are clear and able are going to suddenly discover they're going to be getting it again because it's the antibodies they're now discovering are disappearing in some cases after three to four months. So people mm -hmm. no longer have immunity. So this is going to go on for a long time. And for each of us, we need to find the way that we are most comfortable going forward. And we need to look within ourselves to find out what that looks like. But we're not going to really be going on travel vacations, you know, to exotic places. And I really feel, you know, for the 20, 30, 40 somethings who love, love, love to travel, that this is going to be a time when that's just not possible, not at the kind of level that was experienced before. Mm -hmm. And so I do feel a lot of people are going to really feel themselves impacted as they realize their world is getting smaller and smaller. This is true, this is true. And, you know, the Akashic Record librarians when they were speaking through me two and a half years ago, were predicting 
all of this. And, um, but they were very clear that the sooner humanity comes together as a collective of love, the sooner we'll get through this. But the more we resist coming together as a collective of love, the worse it will get for us or our perception of worth. They're even speaking now going, what, what do you mean worse? What is worse? <laughs> You're having extraordinary experiences. You're learning karmic lessons. You are experiencing so much. Is that worse? I'm like, well, so uh, the more kind and gentle paths we will have when we come to our paths with kind and gentle collective nature, not just the individuals, but all of us connecting is really what we'll see with healing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, as we go forward, I, you know, I think that's such a great, you know, statement because mm -hmm. it's almost as though the more we are able to move into our own spirits and be our own collective selves and be here as a spirit as opposed to an egoic um, personality, because unfortunately, many of our egoic personalities as we look around this world are about dominating as opposed to nurturing. Mm -hmm. um, but as we move forward more into our own souls and become more nurturers, both of ourselves and of others, that gentleness is just going to find its way into larger humanity community. Yes. And that's very exciting. That's very exciting. But between now and then, <laughs> we have a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. And Mariam just said, what about college kids? And like, this is something that, you know, Mariam, this is like right here in our hearts because we both have college kids at home this summer. I think neither of whom were planning on being at home this summer, much less last spring. Um, and I can say I've been doing my due diligence on what is happening in the 3D world, but also opening up about it. And this is really up in the air, you know, because some states like New York is really setting up to be able to absorb students back. Um, and some other states are falling apart around us. It's possible, what I'm seeing is a possibility that if our kids go back to college, that college may end up being in a quarantine bubble until like the end of the semester, like your kid will leave and not return until possibly even, you know, June. Like they may just keep them there all year long, depending on what's happening in the world. It's if, if they get a situation where the kids are healthy and enclosed, they may not want to release them to potentially contaminated home environments and then return to the campus. So this, but if you look at countries that are COVID free right now, which all happen to be female led countries, um, like Norway, New Zealand, uh, Germany, um, their schools are open. They're walking around like everything is fine, but they have quarantined their entire country. It's like, good luck getting into Norway if you're not a Norwegian citizen and you have a home to live in. And same with New Zealand. So, um, yeah, I think staying yeah. fluid around, you know, kids going back because I believe depending upon what university or college they're going to, they've taken different levels of precautions. Mm -hmm. uh, those that are being run by doctors are aware of all of the issues around COVID and are really much more on top of making the changes that are going to be necessary to handle an environment where kids will be getting sick and very sick, uh, yeah. as well as, um, you know, keeping a student body that's well. But not all colleges aren't being run by health professionals. There's a lot of them out there that are just really more business-oriented uh, environments. And I think we're going to see a radical difference from school to school as to what happens and how the kids, what kind of education they actually get while they're there. And mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a big question as to 
how large the population is that gets sick at the school and you know how much they're actually able to finish their studies depending upon how ill they get. And there's also a number of schools that cannot afford to continue unless they have student full body students on campus. They literally do not have enough of a foundation to maintain them without support. So it will be interesting to see how schools that have a huge fellowship of support, like um, Harvard. Harvard has enough money to fund the entire planet, basically. Uh, so much funding. Are they, and they put, but the thing is they don't, they're not miserly. They put this money to use. You know, Harvard has grants going out. They ha they're like very involved in, you know, the educational communities. Well, organizations like that end up going and supporting some of the smaller private schools that may have been around over a hundred years, 200 years, but are floundering now. Or, you know, and some of these smaller schools, um, they have been helping their local community colleges. And now the community colleges are, you know, and doing community programs that they have to withdraw from. So there is like a mandala effect happening here among the educational facilities that also has the potential to evolve, just like humanity. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we will see something like that of um, our government determining that educational facilities deserve support and educational facilities that have finance and resources supporting the ones that are that are good facilities but need a little uh, extra love. Yeah. The other th thing that I see happening, which is that there has been for a long time this movement toward um, looking at higher education and whether or not it's really of as great a value to our citizenry as we have believed it to be. And the flourishing of all of these institutions that are not really providing high level education, but they are just like sucking in the money I think a lot of those who are going to see the death of those, which will put people in a much better place in their 20s without mm -hmm. debt, but having the ability to work and do these jobs that don't require master levels or even bachelor levels. And I believe yeah. that we're going to start making that shift away from, you know, if you don't have an education, you're essentially dead in the water in this country. Yeah. So, and I think that's really good as we start to acknowledge innate intelligence and, and innate capabilities mm -hmm. once again. Yeah. And Mari asks, so uh, what about the future for college? What are we seeing for that? And just as you said, I see even large institutions offering more and more specific, more equivalent to internship or trade school programs that, um, you know, like, if you're in college and you want to study, you know, mechanical engineering, you're supposed to get the base of all the other 100 level classes to be a balanced human being. But I am seeing programs where now they're saying those 100 level classes are now being taught as through the say mechanical engineering program. So, or through the medical program or through the whatever program, I think that students are we're going to get more and more focused on what it is that you want to study and what you want your degree in yeah um, as opposed to being required to take classes that to be honest a lot of these kids are not that thrilled with some of the programs that they're forced to take and it just keeps them from four to five years in a school that they probably could get a viable degree within two years yeah Mm -hmm. And do a lot of online work. Yeah. That's very focused, um, similar to the on the job training programs that a lot of the companies are using at this point. So it's going to be interesting. I think that it's really going to cause a great shift in higher education. You know, the, the Akashic librarians have said through me many times as our planet heals, 
people will start returning to earth and connecting with everyone else on a very heart-based connection. And I, I think what we're talking about with the higher education is also the concept of, instead of having this one style of program, this is the only way you can get a degree, saying all of these other ways of getting your degree are equally valid um, is in a way also a returning to earth, returning to what is it that we need to become trained with what we need to do, you know, yeah. and no longer cookie cutter, you know, we're, so it, it will be um, interesting to see how it evolves because I, I seriously think again, this will be evolving similarly to how humanity needs to evolve. Yeah. Becoming connected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great, great point. I really love it because um, we need to take a different path. We need to get away from this notion of what's a better um, way of expressing on this planet mm -hmm. and find those ways that really allow our spirits, which are sort of unbridled and free, to be unbridled and free so that we can become who we need to become and want to become mm -hmm. as spirit and not get so caught up into the cookie cutter nature of society and what's what's a good profession, what's a bad profession. Right. Uh, and Debbie mentioned the price of school is ridiculous. And outrageous. in this country it is, not necessarily in other countries. So it doesn't need to be. I think just when you try to force something to stay in a format that no longer fits reality, that's when you have to pay more and more and more. Uh, so it's just another sign that the system that we have is a good system, but not like, I don't want to say we have an outdated system, but the fact that it's the only real viable system is outdated. Mm -hmm. That there needs, what students in college now, like they're saying throughout their career, they're going to have like literally 10 different careers, not 10 different specialties within one career because many of the careers that are waiting for them haven't even been conceived of yet you know we're advancing so much how can they go to school and get like a degree that will set them up for all of that they'll constantly be going back to school constantly mm -hmm. yeah I and mean, creating real value both for society and for the self yes you know being continuing education Mm -hmm. which will be a very exciting time. Do we have any more questions? These are great questions. Yeah, that's it about that. But I have something I would like to bring up. Okay. Which is like, okay, I want to start with this one thing that everyone watching are going to go, <laughs> but don't worry. It's just like the, the, the springboard. Um, and how we can take it to the way future, manifesting the best future. One of the most common questions I get from my students and clients is, Benita, Benita, please tell me you don't see Trump winning the next election because we can't handle four more years of that. And the truth is, you know, and like we would never have four more years of what we had because everything has changed. There's no that would require going back and repeating. We, we have coming up ahead four years from here forward. And um, I mean, I think it's looking like odds are Trump's gonna lose by a landslide, but here's the thing. And again, it comes to, do we want the easy path or the hard path? If for some reason, and you guys get ready for what I'm about to say, Trump is elected president for another four years. I think it would most likely be obviously from a rigged election. And I think that would be obvious to everyone. I think we're gonna have a huge switch in Congress and Senate with more Democrats coming in. So we will have a very powerful um, 
liberal or no one who's beholden to Trump political leaders in Senate and Congress. If Trump were to, I, mean, I can't even imagine it, but if he were, if we think now we're rioting in the streets, this is what we're doing when we think he's out the door. It will be very, very interesting to see how many people are like taking the White House down. Also like maybe some of the Southern states like Texas, Mississippi, Alabama might want to like secede and form their own country as DC becomes a state, officially recognized state. Maybe these other states say, well, you know what? Let's go back to where we can just be like ignorant old hicks and set up our own country here. I mean, I, I don't know, but I think if we need a kick in the pants, that would be the kick to make everything explode. And we would see just how um, inefficient, disorganized our government is, and it would require a dismantling and re, you know, reclaiming of our country. How about you, Jean-Marie? What do you, I mean, I'm sure you've heard that question. People are very anxious about it. People are interested. And I've thought, if, I've thought about this a lot. One of the things that I think we'll see is state governments becoming far more important to people and people really choosing what state do I want to live in based on what's available in that state. I, I believe that there will be riots if you, I absolutely agree with you because the thing that Trump is doing is he's closing down more voting areas in black communities, in Latino communities to keep the vote suppressed, especially in the states where he's most contested. So the nation, what I loved about the latest, latest riots was as we sat and watched, since we can't participate, we had to sit and watch um, on the TV, noticing how many non-Black participants there were. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, sometimes literally for a minute as people were walking by, it was all white. And to have the kids, what I love is that the generation that's 40 and under have lived much, much more of an equality environment, in an equality environment. They do not understand why their friend is treated differently because they've never treated them differently. And they're out in the streets, they're protesting going, no, you know, it's just, you know, it's like as a sibling, when one of your siblings got picked on, you went and you protected them. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, they are protecting each other and they're saying no more. You know, right. this is not okay anymore. Um, and so voices are not getting silenced in the way that voices were silenced in the past. So those voices are just going to become louder from all communities, not just from the suppressed community but from all communities. And that's going to cause, unfortunately, those who feel as though their livelihood and world is being attacked, they are going to become more um, vociferous as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to see more clashes. Um, and it's yeah. honestly, it's yeah. about time. I mean, we have a society from an economic perspective that's has way, way too many have nots and the difference between the haves and the have nots, you know, are is dramatic. And I believe people who are in the middle class are beginning to wake up to the fact that they always thought they were part of the haves, but they're actually <laughs> part of the have nots. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as people wake up to that, especially if his healthcare proposal right now that's in the courts goes through and 23 million people lose their health care during mm -hmm. a critical time in our My nation. family. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it's affecting more families because, you know, there's a lot more people who are relying on that because older people are losing their jobs and they can't get them back. 
And mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot of, we saw that in 2008, we're going to see more of that now. And until you can get on Medicare, you are without insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's affecting a lot of people. Um, yeah. So we're going to see, we're going to see a lot of um, interesting movement. And I also think that I love the Republican Party, the movement that's anti-Trump, you know, and saying he really doesn't represent us. Um, and what we value. Yeah. So uh, behind closed doors, I think there's many, many more conversations going on regarding, you know, how do we continue to support this president who's just so out of touch with the populace and with the world. Mm -hmm. um, also, yeah. I don't think I don't think Trump will survive another full presidency. I believe he's far sicker than he um, it's being revealed. So oh, no, there's no question of that. I mean, I worked in healthcare, memory care, hospice care for many years. I know how to spot the signs. That guy is barely glued together. Like people make fun of the way he moves. Like when he, someone's talking and he goes to face him, he doesn't do this. He like spins his whole body around like that. And how he had trouble walking down the ramp. Although my brother thinks he had lifts in his shoes. So he was like wearing basically the equivalent of high heels walking down. <laughs> but when I look at him, I also know that he is wearing like, he is corseted in. He is wearing Spanx and corset. And there were times when I think he's wearing a back brace to hold him up. When you look at him in, when he's on stage, his motions are one of someone who's got a fused spine and so compressed that he cannot swing around the midriff. So, and yeah, and if you look at his colors, you look at his, you know, his skin color, his eye, look at, uh, sometimes levels of bloat, you know, it's, and that's not psychic seer stuff. That's just, ask anyone in healthcare, they can yeah. point out lots of stuff there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, and this is my conspiracy theory, not psychic seer, so I'm going to keep it brief. I think the Republicans thought he would be a puppet monarch and they could use him for their bidding. Republicans who are stepping away from now doesn't mean they're good guys. Um, and I'm not saying all Republicans are bad, but I think a lot of people in political office until very recently have been playing their game. And I'm talking both sides. I think a lot of people have been self-serving and playing the politics game as opposed to actually serving what their constituents want and need. You know, they're serving themselves, not the people that they were hired to represent. I think more and more Democrats have been stepping back into what they're supposed to be doing. And now I think some Republicans are like, oh, I guess we got to do that too. For any Republican who says, oh, you know, I'm just afraid of Trump. He's a bully. Well, they had their opportunity to impeach him and they didn't. So they're not that afraid. If they were afraid, they would have impeached him. I think that, but if someone realizes that their self-service is now harming their ability to care for self, but being of service enhances their ability to care for self, then they step into the pool of the narcissist philanthropist. Helping others helps me. But the end result is they start helping others. So, you know, good. It's a step up. Yes. So I'm sorry, that's my little political rant there. And um, <laughs> I yeah. could never be a politician <laughs> because I'm much too direct on that. But yeah, no, what you were saying, it's, it's um, thinking about this for the future and also tying into what we're talking about for the schools and what Nazi says here, once humanity is able to measure energy, there's a lot of things that will change how to measure love, hate. We need technology to use the heat from the inside of the planet. We need technology to develop waters, et cetera. But, um, oh, Debbie, we'll get to your question in a moment because that's a goodie. But 
uh, Jean-Marie and I were listening to a friend of ours the other day who was saying, you know, the religion of long ago was actually the science of long ago. It was, you know, astronomy, things like that were considered as scientific as our now use of microscope and, you know, everything else we use. And the day will come in the future when the scientists look at what we call science and go, oh, how cute and outdated. And that's where I think things like measuring energy, healing through love, these will be as viable you know, learning to use the frequencies that are not just in our body, but as Jean-Marie is an expert, the parts of our energy that is outside of our body and our connections, you know, and the power of the mind, the power of the heart. I think these will be college degrees or the equivalent, whatever we have then, as much as a uh, pure math or history of theater. Yeah. Um, I believe the consciousness studies are taking us there, the consciousness studies along with the physics, because they just keep merging. Um, and so consciousness studies are the ones that are going to be taking us to those greater depths of how do we measure the electromagnetic aspect of our being and measure the frequencies that are being held by a being. Um, we're still going to struggle with the subtle field, which is the field of the soul, but the electromagnetic field, the field of the aura, um, where we do have a lot of capacity to begin using um, tool sets that man can create. What's going to be more interesting, I think, for all the individuals on this um, call and with interest in the greater self is actually learning to how to use consciousness, which is intelligence. It is the essence of our soul. And once we learn how to use consciousness, we have the capacity individually to know what we need and to be able to see and recognize it outside of ourselves. We, we have the capacity to explore anything we wish to explore. And I believe through the consciousness studies, they're going to be coming, those individual personal technologies are going to be here in 20, 30 years, where people are going to be able to say, you can't lie to me uh -huh. <laughs> because my soul has just registered that as not truth. So, or I can see it clairvoyantly. I can see mm -hmm. that that's not a truth. And so as we become more consciously aware and understanding the vast um, knowledge that we all have and we're using it, we just have not really been taught the technologies of how to use all of this. But as we do move in that direction, people won't be able to pull the wool over other people's eyes quite so easily. And we're going to be a much better society for that. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I see differently, I don't see 20, 30 years. I see like five years, you know, mm -hmm. I see it beginning now, really. Oh, it's like already, it's, a, it's already beginning. Yeah. I mean, you're so that I way. This, I'm that way. Yeah. So I have this rule of thumb that uh, it takes about 20 years mm -hmm. for its things to become widespread. I and think it'll be much quicker than radically that. different. Okay, I, I hope you are correct because yeah. it's going to be such a radically different way of being mm -hmm. than we are today. And to me, that's yeah. actually the very exciting stuff that's going on, which is the actual ascension technologies and the ascension of consciousness. You know what? I see this happening like on TikTok and spreading through all the Gen Hers. And then going up to the Gen Z and then like Gen X, like I see it happening with the kids and spreading like wildfire. And then like, there's no getting away from it. Yeah. yeah. And all, all us, all the parents and grandparents are simply going to be guardians for these little <laughs> beings that are going to be so amazing <laughs> and are so amazing. I mean, I seeing the little ones today, I'm just awed at how present they are. Yeah. 
Um, and let's see, if Trump loses, will we see radical change or gradual shifts? I think both, but Biden has said, and this is not like psychic, Biden has already said something I've been waiting for Trump to say like since last winter, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt already set the platform on how to bring the country back into thriving economically and socially following a, a dire time. And keep in mind, he had polio as well as the Great Depression. So, I mean, not him, I mean, of course he himself did, but he was dealing with the national pandemic of polio um, because they were still figuring all that out. You know, they, they had health issues as well as like a lot of people starving to death and, you know, homeless and unemployed all across our country. He already created the programs. Biden has already said, these programs are still there. We bring them out, dust them off, make them ready for a new era. And we're like, good to go. We already know the success stories and the things that had to evolve to be successful. So I, I think we're gonna see some major, and also Biden's got all this time to like plan and get ready. And his best, most powerful tool is his brilliant wife, Jill, you know, Dr. Jill Biden. She is one of the most brilliant visionaries on our planet and he listens to her. And then his other brilliant tool, the Obamas are his best friends. He listens to them. So I think that we're gonna see a lot of rapid change and a lot of small shifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it will be a good presidency. Um, I've actually, not me personally, but I have seen and heard people saying that he has the ability to become the greatest president that we've ever seen. Yeah, I think he'll go down in history as the greatest president. I don't, I mean, not that he'll necessarily be the greatest president, but because of the dramatic change he'll bring, I think he'll go down in history as like the greatest or one of the greatest presidents. Yeah, that just resonated with me when I read it. Yeah. yeah. It's something for me to say that because he was my bottom choice of all the people running for the Democrat <laughs> ticket, um, my like very last. But I'm actually glad now that he's the one because he has the experience we need. And he, I, I think now, from where we are now, he's the best person for the job. Although the thing that he's gonna have to put in place first is all of the Bernie Sanders platforms, right? Healthcare for all, you know, education for all, like all the things that Bernie was touting, we now see, gee, we should have done that. We need that. Um, Nazi asks only one term or two. Uh, it depends on his health. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that he'll go two terms. Yeah. He's old. He's really old. Mm -hmm. But no matter what he does, you know, he's bringing in a vice president that he's going to groom to become like the first black, female black president. So I think a lot of the platforms he'll put in place are platforms that will support an America that is excited to have our first black woman president. Our first yeah. woman president, but he said he's gonna bring in a black woman. So but I, so I think that um, if he can do two terms, I think he'd be electable for it, but I don't know if his health and age will allow for that. Yeah, it's gonna, any president, it's going to wear them out mm -hmm. with what the amount of shift and change and legislation that's going to be required. Yeah. And the, the effort that it will take to bring the country together is going to be strong. Yeah. It's going to require a great deal of whoever we put in that position. Yeah. So here's something that uh, a very wise person said to me. I mentioned it to Jean-Marie the other day. Um, homo sapiens are by nature weak bullies 
um, that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals evolved at the same time. The Neanderthals were actually superior in every way. So the Homo sapiens killed the Neanderthals and took over. Since then, through humanity, the humans who are pretty much the puniest, least capable, least competent beings on the planet have basically usurped the planet. Like if you take a cow and a human, the cow is bigger and stronger and more capable of living on its own in nature than a human is, you know, without help from anyone. So what do we do? We put the cow in a box, we enslave it, we tell it how it's allowed to live, what it's allowed to eat, when it's allowed to do whatever it does. Also, we can have cheeseburgers and milkshakes. So humans have a propensity for the smallest, weakest member or slice of humanity to survive by putting down usurping, overseeing, enslaving, or just like regulating anyone that they perceive as a threat to their puny, you know, masterhood. Um, and again, these are not my words, but I thought this, I think this is brilliant. Um, so if you look at who claims to be the most important people in our country, it comes down to very restrictive, claiming to be Christian, white men who do not want anyone else to have power. So therefore, by the logic of this, they are the least powerful members of the American society. And if the rest of American society realizes we are so powerful that we do not need them to mandate us, then that's when we can throw off, you know, burst the pens open and go out and be free. Mm -hmm. um, the person who said this to me was a teenager, I will say, very, very wise, insightful teenager. <laughs> so, and, yeah. yeah, so when, what I really see through that is this concept of dominating that we like to dominate, we like to enslave, um, to and dictate, dictate, and that this is what, not just in the male white society that has somehow created this supremacy on our planet, but that we need to look at that within each of our own cells and our families, that this desire to dominate you know, whether it's dominating a quest, you know, a conversation, whether it's dominating so that what you believe to be right is the thing that happens, um, that we need to really look at how each of us takes this concept of winning. You know, do we do it through domination or do we do it through um, group action? You know, can we tolerate differences of opinion and realize that there is a way that we can create another reality other than the one that we might have had in our minds? Um, you know, and even with our children, we part of the problem that I do see with our education system as it is now is it continues to try and dominate how learning happens. Mm -hmm. um, so... I believe as we go forward over the next 50 to 100 years, this whole question of dominating, weeding that out of our own spirits and allowing for um, people to come to have their own way, to be able to live in this world with their own opinions. And by doing it in such a gentle way that they want to nurture others, you know, so that even though there will be a lot more differences, there will be more of a nurturing culture and an accepting yeah. culture. Yeah, I think you're right. And that segues perfectly to Debbie's question, what spiritual changes do you see coming? Oh, 
the spiritual. So I, I have to say, do I want to talk about the spiritual changes I want to see coming? <laughs> um, what you see, what you see. <laughs> um, so I get really excited because I see religion dying religion it's already dying it is going to there's going to be a death knell in religion which returns all of us to a relationship with our own soul a relationship with our own spark a relationship with divinity itself that is within us um the challenge for humanity right now is to turn inward mm -hmm. and what better time than corona time to force us to go inward um, the faster we start doing it, the better off we're going to be. And hopefully this will be the last virus of this kind that we're going to have to deal with. It will. Uh, I know, hopefully. <laughs> but um, because we're going to be continuing to be challenged to going inward. Um, and I see the challenge of this time and all the things that we are talking about is challenging us all to go inward to find out who we are and how we want to express ourselves in a nurturing not a dominating way you know how do we become the nurturers both of ourselves through self-love self-compassion um, because if we can't have it for ourselves you can't have it for anybody else it's not real yeah and i actually see visions of really like the librarians have been showing me this for years humanity coming together in compassionate love and harmony um and one of the things that i see is like all the stuff that jean marie and i do i see everyone being able to do this that everyone will be empathic telepathic connecting with energy the viruses that are coming out now and by the way you know the coronavirus it is not a flu bug like calling it the flu was a marketing thing from you know politicians it is not a flu bug it is uh connected with like marburg and ebola they are all viral but trust me it is not a flu you are lucky if you get it's like a bad flu so, um, but what I'm seeing is all of these are coming up because of humanity's destructive nature to our planet. When humanity starts coming together in harmony, these viruses, these illnesses will not have a need to appear. We're kicking it up, we're kicking it up. It's kindred to um, like, if you keep getting into relationships with someone who's mean to you, and you leave that relationship, but the next one, someone's mean to you and you leave that one and they're mean to you because you have not learned your karmic lesson. It's the same, humanity has not learned our karmic lesson. So we're kicking up situations where the planet is mean to us. Some parts of our planet are learning their lesson. They're like, you know what? We're just gonna be in harmony and we're closing our borders. You know, we're, we're seeing that. But I see a future where if, illness is coming to anyone they're able to as jean marie says love themselves from the inside out flow with the energy send the energy out and energetically connect with their brothers and sisters for added support and then whatever is unhealthy comes through i see a day when humanity has the ability to then just send love to it and transmute it to healthful energy we have ill energy now because we're doing ill on the planet. I see a future where we are so resplendent with love and health and flowing goodness that we transmute the energy around us. The question is getting from here to there. Yes. And not letting what's happening today dim our future vision. Mm -hmm. um, we really need everyone to hold a beautiful future vision. We need our um, creative minds to create that future and also to push ourselves to do whatever is required to embrace it and to release from our own beings 
those things that keep us suppressed, you know, and to notice if our spirit was broken when we were little and to heal our own spirits so that we can look within to find the beauty instead of having to have intermediaries, whoever they might be, whether they're religious figures, political figures, you know, just anybody that, you know, you latch on to because you want them to be an intermediary for you. You need to become your own ruler, your own mm -hmm. self. Step into your own power. Yeah. I see a lot of people stepping into their own power in the future, which means children are able to be born into their own power and stay there. Well, I believe actually they are born into that power. I believe in right. the dominating nature that worries that culture is going to see them differently than every other you know, child of that age. And having raised one of those, I know how strong culture is mm -hmm. um, to allow them to not break their spirit, to allow them to come into being um, you know, with their self-will that where they know what they need, they know what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and for them to come into the gentleness of that as well. Uh, without being dominated yes so yes and that'll be interesting the word dominate I think is going to become like old-timey slang that mm -hmm. you know 30 years ago someone would go what's that word I just read in an old book what does it mean yeah you know, it's, it's like we talk about our spirits guides and guardians we have to become guides and guardians for others mm -hmm. here on this earth yeah um so all of that's very exciting how are we doing on time uh we are getting ready to wrap up so let's talk about way future what do we see so that people can keep this vision in their minds as we're going through the now it's like what's what's this beautiful light at the end of the tunnel oh it's it doesn't necessarily mean that your surroundings are going to be so different as it means how you walk through them will feel so different and how you feel about your neighbors, how you feel about the strangers that you meet that might look different to you, um, how you treat your family. You know, that is where I see the shift in humanity. Um, there are going to be dramatic earth changes. Um, and as we get through this ascension period, there's going to be a tremendous reduction in the amount of people that earth supports. Uh, but that those of us who choose to come back, um, those of us who want to be here in this exciting, it's hard to believe, but this is an exciting place to come. And I love this place. But that, you know, we'll come here in an ability to, instead of having this veil between the egoic nature and the spirit, that will be gone. We will be spirits here manifesting in physical form um, all the beautiful things that we know from our spirit selves, yeah. our soul selves. We will actually be souls walking the earth. I see that too. I see a time when, when we come into life, we're not disconnected from our soul. You know, we're aware of who we were and what our current lessons are. What is it that we're here for? And just think like, what's so hard on us in this life is that we forget everything and we're disconnected. We're taken away from the daily conversations with our soul. But I see in the future, we know who we are. We know what we're doing here. We know who we were and what our goals are. And we're able to ask our brothers and sisters around us for help when we need it. And they can, you know, because we see like, who's the best person to help me and who can I help as we're going through this, a much more evolved, aware version of what we have now. Mm -hmm. So you know, and Nazi asked, can we give good news for the not too distant? The good news I see is 
we all of us have the ability to be that way now. It's a matter of accepting and acknowledging it and just becoming attuned to the language of truly being yourself and releasing everything that is not part of that. You know, releasing the all the ways that you judge yourself and you push yourself and saying, who am I really and why am I really here? Then how important is everything else? Like the writer, Toni Morrison said, one day she sat down because she was like a single mother of two small children. She was, um, you know, a publisher for a major, for Random House. She was a author, she was doing tours, she was teaching at Princeton, you know, every weekend she was like so much going on. Plus, you know, cooking, shopping, et cetera, household chores. She made a list of everything she had to do like that week and it covered a paper, crammed. And then she looked and said, what do I really have to do? And there were two items care for my children, and write. So when you look to yourselves and you're like, who do I need to be? What do I need within me to define myself as myself? You're welcome to make a list of everything. And then really connect with your soul energy and say, what do I really need to do? And go ahead and release all the things that are just like, burdens, barriers, unfinished karma, self-judgment, you know, anything that stops you from shining your light. Go ahead and release and say, I'll deal with you later when I'm ready. For now, I need to connect with myself, shine my lights, and go forward. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of time back during the day. <laughs> and then you discover you fill it up with all the things that you want to do. Actually, that's the that is the precious gift for me of this moment, because being in an age group that is of high at very high risk. Um, at in the beginning, it was like there were these large gaps of time in my day, and then I realized, well, I got to do what I love to do. And I have just been filling up my days only with things I really want to do. And if I don't want to cook, I don't cook. <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, I don't want to cook. I want to go listen to that thing, or I want to go do some writing, or I want to go do some meditating. Um, you know, it's just fill the day with the things that are of greatest importance to yeah. you and those you care for. Yeah. And it's a little different for me because I do have to work. And I have a family to take care of, but at the same time, it's exactly the same. It is amazing how many things I have released from my schedule and my priorities and my self-perceptions, all of the, I can't do this, I can't do that. I'm like, oh, wait, no, I can't. You know, who's going to stop me? Oh, I have to do this. Oh, do I really? I don't know. Maybe I don't. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I know if we do this in the here and now, it'll make that beautiful future we want so much more connected. Mm -hmm. And even if you're in the here and now and not in the future, it will start becoming more like that. Yeah. And I think for everyone here to ask really what is yours to do? Mm -hmm. And what do you take on because others believe you should? Or you believe that... Um, by talking about things, that that makes them happen. But really look at what is yours to do at this time. And then push away the things that you can't influence, you can't make changes in. Or if there's places that you do want to see some change, figure out what's the minimum requirement for you in those things to satisfy your soul's desire to have a voice there, knowing that you have a limited capacity to make a change there. So make the changes where you really can, where it's really for you to do. Right? Yeah. Well, that's beautiful and we're out of time. So <laughs> that's the perfect, thank you all. Thank you all for joining and um, Jean-Marie, you have just 
re-inspired me with your beautiful words. Thank you everybody for joining us. It's really been beautiful. Have a wonderful day and we will catch up with you all again later.